Hello everyone and welcome back to Nuclear Reactor Theory Lectures. Today we're going to do a deep dive into the physics of elastic scattering. Our eventual goal is to be able to predict the energy and direction of particles that undergo scattering reactions. These quantities will be vital later on when we compute the probability that fast neutrons will thermalize after undergoing some number of scattering reactions. Before we discuss elastic scattering, let's spend a minute talking about the kind of scattering that we're not going to talk about, thermal neutron scattering. Thermal neutron scattering is interesting because at thermal energies, we are once again confronted by the wave-like nature of particles. These slower neutrons have an energy and wavelength that is similar to the energy of the bond between atoms, which means that these neutrons will actually diffract off of the atomic crystalline structure of materials. This makes some materials with a crystalline structure, such as graphite, excellent scattering materials, even though, as we'll see at the end of this lecture, carbon atoms are fairly heavy and really aren't that good at slowing down neutrons. The S alpha beta function describes how this wave-like behavior increases the scattering cross-section for neutrons. Essentially, it is a correction factor for free gas, or non-crystalline structure, nuclide cross-sections. S alpha beta is a key piece of nuclear data. Without S alpha beta adjusted cross-sections for materials like water and graphite, our simulations would produce embarrassingly incorrect eigenvalue estimates for nuclear reactors and other nuclear systems. We won't discuss S alpha beta cross-sections too much in this course, but it is a very important concept that was worth mentioning at some point. Before we discuss scattering kinematics, let's introduce the concept of solid angles which are represented using the omega symbol. The solid angle of a neutron describes the field of view that the neutron has projected onto some arbitrary unit sphere. In other words, the solid angle describes the neutron's direction. We can describe any location on a unit sphere as a combination of the phi angle, which is the projection of the location onto the xy plane, and the theta angle, which is the angle between the vector and the z axis. If we draw a vector from the origin towards any arbitrary location on the unit sphere, we can describe that vector by this combination of the phi and theta angles, where ux, uy, and uz are unit vectors along the x, y, and z axes. Note also that phi ranges from 0 to 2 pi, and that theta ranges from 0 to pi. If we have some arbitrary non-unit vector v, then we can find its unit vector by normalizing v which is, in other words, by dividing v by the magnitude of v. The term d omega, which is the differential amount of area on the unit sphere surrounding the solid angles vector, is equal to the sine of theta times d theta times d phi. This term will be important later on, as we'll need to integrate different expressions and functions over ranges of solid angles. If, for example, we integrate d omega by itself over all solid angles, which means from phi ranging from 0 to 2 pi and theta ranging from 0 to pi, we find that this integral equals 4 pi. This makes sense since the area of a sphere is 4 pi r squared and the radius of our unit sphere is 1. Now, moving on to scattering. Suppose that we have a neutron with an initial energy E and an initial direction omega that scatters into a new energy E prime and a new direction omega prime. The double differential scattering cross-section describes the cross-section that this neutron will scatter to within d e prime of energy e prime and within d omega prime of direction omega prime. Because it describes how a neutron can change energy and direction after undergoing a scattering reaction, the double differential scattering cross-section describes the physics of scattering at its most fundamental level, and it's actually what nuclear data scientists measure to describe scattering kinematics. The double differential scattering cross-section can be transformed into several useful quantities. For example, if we integrate it over all possible outgoing directions, omega prime, our double differential scattering cross-section turns into a single differential scattering cross-section that describes a cross-section for scattering from one energy into another energy. If we do the opposite and integrate over all possible outgoing energies, then we get the probability that a neutron with some energy will scatter from one direction into another direction. Lastly, if we integrate over both E prime and omega prime, then we obtain the scalar scattering cross-section, which is simply the cross-section that a neutron at some energy will undergo any scattering reaction. Before we move on, 
it's worth mentioning that these scattering cross-sections are usually represented in terms of mu naught instead of omega, where mu naught is the cosine of the angle at which the neutron is deflected by the scattering reaction. Essentially, mu naught is the dot product of the initial pre-scatter and the final post-scatter solid angles. The probability of scattering off of a nucleus generally does not at all depend on the direction of the incoming neutron, so it's convenient to use mu naught, or the angle of deflection, when describing and measuring scattering kinematics data. It doesn't usually matter if the neutron is coming from the left or the right, we can always reorient our perspective so that the neutron is heading directly towards the nucleus, so the neutron's angle of deflection is the real relevant quantity. The one exception to this rule is thermal scattering. When neutrons behave like waves and diffract off of groups of target nuclei, and the orientation of the material's atomic crystal structure has an enormous influence on how the neutron diffracts off of the material. Now that we have the basics covered, let's dive into the details of scattering kinematics. Our goal here is to predict the energy and direction distributions of neutrons that undergo scattering collisions, and also to understand how these energy and direction variables are correlated. Before we dive into this material, I should warn you that my derivation goes rather quickly, especially for a YouTube video, and actually skips some steps. I would recommend pausing this video throughout the derivation, making sure that you understand each individual step before I move on to the next one. Let's consider a neutron with mass m that scatters off of a nucleus that is at rest and has mass capital M. In general here, we will use capital letters to represent variables associated with the target nucleus and lowercase letters for variables associated with the incoming neutron. If we were to watch this collision from the laboratory frame, which is exactly how we would view this collision if we had some ultra-high resolution microscope, then we would see the neutron approach the target nucleus with a velocity v sub l, and after the collision both the neutron and the target will have velocities v sub l prime and capital v sub l prime respectively. These two bodies will be deflected at some angles where theta l is the angle at which the neutron deflects. In this derivation, we'll derive a moving point that happens to sit at the center of the mass for the system. Because this point is located at the system's center of mass, then to its frame of reference, the overall momentum present in the system equals zero. As the neutron approaches the target nucleus, this center of mass point will also have to move to remain at the system's center of mass, and it does so with velocity v sub cm. We can assume that the mass of the neutron is about equal to one, and we'll also assume that the mass of the target nucleus is some a instead of some m. If we use these definitions to solve for the velocity at which the center of mass point stays at the center of mass, then we'll see that the velocity of this point, vcm, must equal one over one plus a times v sub l. If we consider the scattering reaction from the perspective of the center of mass point, then this point stays stationary and sees a neutron with velocity v sub c and a nucleus with velocity capital v sub c approaching each other until they collide right at the center of mass. To convert the velocity of the neutron and the target nucleus from the lab frame into the center of mass frame, we have to subtract the velocity of the center of mass point from each body's velocity. This means that the incident neutron is traveling at velocity a over a plus 1 times v sub l in the center of mass frame, and that the now non-stationary target nucleus is traveling at a velocity of negative 1 over a plus 1 times v sub l in the center of mass frame. Since this collision is elastic and is not inelastic, we know that the kinetic energy and momentum of the system must be conserved before and after the collision occurs. If we do a little bit of mathematical digging, we'll see that the only possible way to conserve both momentum and energy in the center of mass frame is if v sub c equals v sub c prime, and if capital v sub c also equals capital v sub c prime. If we compare the neutron's post-collision velocities in the laboratory and the center of mass frames in both the x and y directions, then we'll see that v sub l prime times sine theta l equals v sub c prime times sine of theta c, and in x, that v sub l prime times cosine of theta l equals v c m plus v c prime times cosine of theta c. We can take the ratio of these two expressions, noting that v sub c prime divided by v c m equals a, 
we find this interesting relation between the neutron scattering angles in the laboratory and the center of mass frames. This relationship between the two sets of angles is crucial for nuclear data scientists. The theory behind scattering kinematics takes place in the center of mass frame, but in real life we can only observe scattering events in the laboratory frame. This relationship that we have just defined allows us to convert scattering angles back and forth from the lab frame where we can observe them to the center of mass frame where they are described by our physics models. Now let's try and develop an expression for the final energy of the scattering neutron as a function of its initial energy and the angle at which it scatters. We can relate the post-scattering velocities of the neutron in the laboratory and center of mass frames using this triangle of vectors, and we're going to apply the law of cosines to this triangle using this theta a. Before we do that, we can use the properties of parallel lines to see that this angle here also equals theta l, and given that this other angle here equals theta c, we can find that this theta x equals theta c minus theta l. This means that our theta a, for which we're using the law of cosines, thus equals 180 degrees minus theta c. We can apply the law of cosines to this theta a, and after noting that v sub c prime equals a times vcm, and that the cosine of 180 degrees minus some theta equals the negative cosine of that theta, we can develop this expression for v sub l prime squared. If we recall our previous relationship between vl and vcm and square it, then we can divide these two expressions to develop a ratio for v sub l prime squared divided by v sub l squared, which is actually also equivalent to the ratio of the kinetic energy for the neutron in these pre- and post-scatter states. We can rearrange some terms, define this convenient alpha parameter, which is a function of a, and rename e and e prime to be the initial and final neutron energies, and then after doing this we develop this expression for relating the two energies. With this expression we have achieved our goal. We can determine the final energy of a neutron after it scatters if we know the neutron's initial energy and the angle in the center of mass frame at which it scattered. This equation has some profound consequences on reactor physics. A neutron will lose the minimum amount of energy possible in a scattering reaction if it scatters at an angle of zero degrees. In this case, E final equals E initial, and the neutron has really just grazed the target nucleus without really interacting with it very much. If you've ever played pool and share my abysmal amount of pool skill, then you've probably experienced the zero degree deflection that occurs when you just barely graze a target ball with the cue ball. On the other hand, the neutron transfers the maximum possible amount of energy to the target nucleus if it recoils at an angle of 180 degrees in the center of mass frame. This means that the neutron either stops or is now actually moving backwards compared to the center of mass frame. People who are better pool players than I am have probably experienced this phenomenon when the cue ball hits another ball dead on and comes to a complete stop. When this kind of perfect stop occurs, the final energy of the neutron is equal to alpha times E sub i. So in other words, the amount of energy a neutron can lose after one collision is limited, and it's a function of alpha. As nuclei become heavier and heavier, alpha approaches 1, which means that neutrons can't lose very much energy, in fact barely any at all, by scattering off of heavy nuclei. In contrast, neutrons can lose a lot of energy when they scatter off of light nuclei. This is why moderators, which seek to thermalize high-energy, fast neutrons, are universally made out of low Z materials. Hydrogen, where A equals 1 and alpha equals 0, is one of the best moderating materials because a neutron can potentially lose all of its kinetic energy in one single collision. Let's end our discussion today by once again discussing probability distributions. Turns out, we can decompose our single differential scattering cross-section into the product of the scalar scattering cross-section and this probability function. This decomposition makes sense, since the cross-section that a neutron will scatter to some energy should equal the cross-section that the neutron will scatter at all, times the probability that a scattering event will move the neutron to that energy E prime. So what is this probability distribution for elastic scattering? How probable is it for a neutron to scatter to some specific energy? 
Since there is a one-to-one -one relation between the neutron's final energy and the angle at which it scatters, then we can relate the energy probability distribution function to the angular probability distribution function, which we will choose to represent as a function of theta c, since phi doesn't really matter. Now let's use this relationship to solve for the probability that a neutron will scatter from energy Ei to energy Ef. We can take the derivative of both sides of the scattering energy relationship that we just defined to get d theta c over d e sub f. And we can define the angular scattering probability distribution function for theta c, which is equal to the single differential angular scattering cross-section for theta c divided by the scalar scattering cross-section. In practice, this angular scattering probability distribution function is something that we would measure experimentally. With these two components, we can find that the probability of scattering from energy E sub i to energy E sub f equals 4 pi times the single differential angular scattering cross-section for theta c divided by 1 minus alpha times E sub i times the scalar scattering cross-section. This relationship only applies for the set of energies to which the neutron can scatter, where again the maximum post-scatter energy is E sub i, and the minimum post-scatter energy is alpha times E sub i. Isotropic scattering refers to scattering reactions where the neutron has an equal probability to scatter into any direction. In this case, our single differential angular scattering cross-section is simply the scalar sigma scatter divided by 4 times pi. Notice that when we integrate this quantity over all 4 pi of solid angles in the unit sphere, we are left with simply the scalar scattering cross-section. If we substitute this expression back into our energy probability distribution function, then we see that this function is equal to 1 divided by 1 minus alpha times e sub i. If we take the first moment of this probability distribution function, then we'll see that the average post-scatter energy equals 1 plus alpha divided by 2 times e sub i, and also that the average energy lost by a neutron undergoing a scattering reaction is 1 minus alpha divided by 2 times e sub i. This again reinforces what we said earlier about light, low z moderators. Low z moderators have smaller values of alpha, which means that they allow the neutron to obtain a lower average E final and a higher average delta E after each collision. This concludes our dive into the kinematics of elastic scattering reactions. The formulas derived in the concepts discussed today will reappear several times in this course, where they will be used to predict the probability that neutrons will survive absorption resonances and live on to thermalize. In the following lectures, we will begin discussing the neutron economy and eventually the Boltzmann transport equations.